So welcome to our virtual conference on shaping the future of education. And this is the finale event to what's been a great summer of our festival of innovation for students across Scotland and in fact beyond actually. And in the past few weeks, uh, you have been creating uh, new opportunities and new visions about the future of education. I've been delighted, well, in fact, amazed to see how many students from colleges and universities have been uh, sort of taken up the festival challenge. And today, the conference conversations we're going to have are going to shine a light on some of the inspirational ideas that have emerged and show just how much students are thinking about the future. It's really so important that across further and higher education, um, that we of course impart a strong sense of purpose in 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 you our students and also an ability of our students to have confidence to shape the future and to be future ready so i'd like to actually just uh, start by expressing our appreciation on behalf of all the students and all the people here to the great team at sie who've created and run the festival you've done a really great job so thank you and of course uh, the disruptive effects of covid have have challenged us they've stretched our patience and at the moment i can feel really sensitized our emotions i think particularly at the moment um, but of course, all of this has had the effect of energizing our imagination. And uh, some have said that we would have waited five years to see the levels of innovation that we're going to experience over the next 18 months. Well, I actually agree with this. And uh, across our universities in Scotland in recent months and the colleges too, we've seen a plethora of new, radically different ways of working. And some of these, I'm sure, are going to be picked up in our conference today. So um, today we're going to explore the future, demonstrate some ways that the Scottish Institute of Enterprise is empowering students and academic staff to reimagine this future that we all have responsibility to, to shape and support. So thank you for being with us today. Our delegates online include higher education and further education teaching staff, students and others who are interested in supporting innovative students. We have participants from right across Scotland's outstanding entrepreneurial ecosystem. And I often say that, of course, one of the amazing characteristics of Scotland is we have a really good entrepreneurial ecosystem, something that we should be continuing to celebrate and to celebrate more, particularly uh, at this time. So ahead, we've got some fascinating talks and workshops and I'm delighted to say we have two notable keynote presentations to bring an international perspective to our conference debate. And the first one is Professor Geoff Scott of Western Sydney University, and he's going to focus on uh, students and helping them to become work ready plus using the UN Sustainability Development Goals as a guide to shape a better future. And our second keynote is from Professor Todd Davey from the Institute Mean Telecom Business School, Paris. And uh, he's going to focus on how higher education institutions could change. Now, I'll be coming back um, for the panel session, which is at midday, along with some other inspirational guests from the further and higher education sectors. And we're going to be discussing how can we make lasting positive changes to education and involve and empower students in the process. So that's coming up later on at midday and I invite you to uh, bring your sandwiches and come and uh, join in with us. So do enjoy the conference and remember ahead the world is going to be shaped how we shape it and uh, so we are shapers. Go shape. See you later. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Richard. And um, very, uh, very concise and very great introduction. So concise that we're actually a few minutes ahead of time. And I think if people are like me, they'll quite often wait and wait and dial in when the keynote speaker is about to start. So I'm rather unwilling to start Jeff's talk too soon. But Jeff, if you wouldn't mind maybe just sharing your first slide and we can just chat for a moment or two before you kick off formally, if that's okay? Yep, yep sure. 
sure. Here we go. That's great. Thank you very much. So um, anybody that's just joining us, uh, Jeff is speaking in, a, we'll start speaking his formally in about four minutes time. Um, so I think I think this might just be an opportunity just for Jeff to say hello to everyone. Let us know what life is like in Sydney at the moment. You can see that we're having a beautiful sunny day in Glasgow. You can't tell from my fantastic backdrop here, but it actually is absolutely glorious. Uh, not a cloud in the sky. And as you can see from Jeff's background, it's already nighttime in Sydney. So how have you been getting on over there? Yeah. Oh, it's all good down here. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling for you guys now with the, you know the uh, what's happening with COVID for you down here today. We had a New South Wales no community transmissions at all for the first time since July. So, you know, it's a, it's an iffy sort of a situation to be in. But um, today I went surfing. Uh, the temperature today was 24. Uh, the surf was superb. Um, and of course, you know, it's the end of winter down here. So. That's all I want to say about being down under in Australia. But uh, so at the moment things are, are are going reasonably well down here, and uh, and uh, you know I'm thinking of you guys uh, in the UK as well. And uh, you know I hope everything goes really well for you in the coming months as winter descends, and uh, uh, you know hopefully you won't get too much hassle with the the COVID um, um, outbreak. Yeah, I certainly hope so. I mean, this is the, the colleges have gone back, the universities are all going back, students are coming back onto campus and everybody's just, I, I think, just waiting for things to, to start. And at the same time, we're very aware that um, COVID is still around. So, it, you know, <laughs> uh, it, it's going to be a, a, let's hope that in a few months time, we'll be talking as you're talking, that life is getting back to normal. Although I don't think certainly here in Scotland, we'll be surfing in 24 degrees. Otherwise we'll have some <laughs> real other media concerns on our hands yeah, if that happens yeah. over the next few months. So I think uh, it's probably time for me to stop chit chatting and um, actually possibly a good reminder to people who want to chat, that if you want to just kind of make any comments or chat, please feel free to use the chat box. And uh, yeah, Jeff is going to got questions in advance. So that was fantastic. And he's actually going to fill pretty much his full, full half hour, but he will be willing to respond to people later. So if you do have questions, then please go ahead. At this point, I'm going to shut my camera off and leave it over to Jeff. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thanks, Fiona, and um, and hello, everyone. It's uh, absolutely a pleasure to be with you, and um, I've got lots of fond memories. And of course, being a Scot, I have connections to Scotland through my um, my relatives. Uh, um, I've got McEachrans in the in the other side of my family as well. So, like a, a number of um, people who uh, are down here in Australia, of course, we've got that heritage. Um, so it's very nice to be with you. So, look, I'm going to just um, quickly whip through these slides. I know that they've been sent out to you in advance and um, I promise I'm not going to read them out to you. I'm just going to give you a sense of um, the work that um, we've been engaged in around the world using social enterprise to address the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals uh, is, is what we've been doing. And I've been working in about 40 countries on that over the last two or three years um, uh, with a lot of interest, particularly in, uh, in post-secondary and higher education, but also uh, in schools. Um, so I'm going to take you through just what that entails and, uh, and then just uh, quickly have a look at four themes. Um, the first one is uh, really to make the point that the Sustainable Development Goals actually, in a sense, represent a set of values and a moral purpose. Uh, and th there's an issue then in education about whether education has lost its moral purpose or not. So that's my first theme. Um, the second is there's a real difference between change and progress. Change is something becoming different and progress is a value judgment by individuals that that's actually good. Uh, and therefore values really do drive, I think, uh, what's going to be happening as you're shaping your, your sustainable future. Um, then the next one is good ideas with no ideas and how to implement them are wasted ideas and change doesn't just happen. It has to be led, but definitely. And that's really the, the idea of what do you do on Monday? Like you're going to have a conference now. 
the issue is, is anything going to change on Monday? Are you going to do anything different on Monday? And I've spent 40 years looking at what do you do on Monday to, in fact, engage people uh, with desired change, i.e. progress. And the, the final one really is uh, change is learning. Change is actually learning how to do something new. And therefore, of course, I, I believe strongly, uh, and it's a moral purpose of mine, that universities and colleges have a key role in implementing the sustainable development goals, which I think do have embedded in them some values about a, what is a decent way to live your life. So that's the themes. I'm going to whip through these, the, the rest of the slides reasonably quickly. Uh, and then, as, as uh, Fiona said, uh, we're going to be sending out a survey after this. And I, I would be delighted if you send in any queries, any things you want to follow up, anything that uh, you, you find interesting and you want to know more about, um, then I'll ask the folks at SIE to aggregate up your queries and then I'll respond to all of you um, uh, with uh, answers to your, your, your questions and your issues that you'd like to follow up on. So um, the, 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 I'm just not going to go through these and read them out to you, but I just want to flick them up for you. Basically, they're the sorts of, in a sense, values that underpin the 17 Sustainable Development Goals that have been agreed to by 192 nations. Now, they've been agreed to by 192 nations. It doesn't really mean anything's happening in the, on the ground just by agreeing to it. And that's, of course, where education plays a role. And that's where students, you students who are tuning in today, you are, in fact, the implementers. And therefore, why aren't we not dealing with this in our universities and colleges, uh, helping people to look at how to make change work as it relates to the moral purpose of these sustainable development goals? And in a sense, when you look at the, the 17 goals, they, they actually, to make sense of them, they actually address four dimensions uh, of sustainability social, cultural, economic, and environmental. So if you have a look down that list there, and if you have a look at the four dimensions, social, cultural, economic, and environmental, um, uh, I think it picks up all of, all of the goals in those four dimensions. So that's just a way of getting ahead around what the focus area of the goals is, I suppose. And there's the goals, and you'll see that they reflect very much what I, the previous slide said. And I'm not gonna read them out to you. Um, but I, I will just highlight goal four, which is quality education. And section 4.7 of that goal in the actual United Nations documents talks about actually making using education to make the sustainable development goals work. And that's really what I'm addressing today. Uh, number 17 is also interesting because what I'm also addressing is the idea that we should be having a set of values, which is why don't we rather than why don't you? And, and that's where change requires folks to actually be working together to enact the goals uh, in a collaborative way that is nuanced and actually takes into account how change works and is creative and inventive. Not just commercially inventive in terms of entrepreneurship, but socially inventive, because all of those goals are very much uh, about social purpose. Um, so uh, I wanted to then talk seeing as COVID's still currently um, uh, of, of high importance to the countries around the world, I just want to show you how COVID-19 relates directly to the Sustainable Development Goals, which in turn relates to the extent to which we will uh, actually be doing something about COVID-19. And I just want to show you how those 17 goals, almost every one of them actually relates to uh, try, what we're trying to do to address COVID at the moment. So, you know, the health crisis, uh, as we know, has triggered an economic crisis, which has triggered changed ways of living, which has triggered changed laws, which has altered freedoms. And you've got people in the States going out and having demos about wearing masks. Uh, and that's had a, a, also a range of environmental impacts. Now, I want to show you, uh, I'm just writing a chapter for a book at the moment on this. So I want to show you some of the things we're exploring in that chapter here. You know, in a way, we have to concurrently be focusing. This is why it's such a wicked problem, COVID. We've got to look at how the virus works, at zoonotic, zoonotic transfer works, how to make a vaccine, uh, how to understand epidem epidemiology, making sure the water's clean when people are actually drinking, patterns of food production. You can see them all there, wet markets and cultural sustainability, travels, change, quarantine. You know, it's, 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 it's a classic example of a wicked problem. These are the wicked problems that we should be putting at the centre of our curriculum in higher education, rather than just looking at content 
and looking at specific occupations and learning how to regurgitate the textbooks and the skills and knowledges in particular professional areas. They are necessary. Of course, we have to have those if we want to get a job, but they are not sufficient for the future. And that's where this work I've been doing as Australia's National Senior Teaching Fellow comes in. I've been working for the last four years with 160 universities around the world to develop not just work-ready graduates for today, people who are competent at skills and knowledge in their profession, but work-ready plus graduates for an uncertain future, people who can manage mad moments with mad people and wicked problems. And that's where social entrepreneurship comes in. And that's where building it into the core of the curriculum in universities and focusing on the sustainable development goals and that comes in. Because as you can see from COVID, COVID actually triggers, a wicked problem triggers pretty well all of those sustainable development goals. And the issue is, are we doing anything in the curriculum to help folks look at what they might do to help contribute to this complexity of interacting factors in a way that is uniform and united rather than disaggregated? So I just wanted to make that point to you. I thought it'd be useful just to quickly go through a few terms. And this is these are all defined in a book that I wrote with Michael Fullen uh, years and years ago, 2009, on uh, uh, turnaround leadership for higher education, um, which is uh, which actually won the US College's Bill Weller Award in 2010. Uh, and that's really about what do you do on Monday, which is really about, in a sense, the curriculum issues for students about helping students become change implementation savvy as part of the curriculum, intentionally learning how to actually be inventive, having opportunities to be socially inventive, learning how to make the changes work, their inventions work, which is separate from just inventing them, uh, being sustainability literate and being actually clear on the tacit assumptions driving the 21st century agenda. Like where do we stand on them really in terms of values? You know, and those tacit assumptions are things like um, uh, growth is good, uh, consumption's happiness, information technology is always the answer, and globalisation's great. You know, where do we stand on those? Because it's those values that underpin how we go about trying to address the sustainable development goals uh, in a way that's morally robust. Because wicked problems require you to actually make hard decisions. Uh, so change is just something becoming different. Progress is this issue of building in your values and actually working out what is worthwhile and valuable. Uh, competence is about the skills and knowledge that you need to have as a necessary entry into being a doctor or whatever you're going to be. Um, but capability is how do you manage that un unexpected, problematic patient that difficult moment with the person when you've got to give incredibly bad news. And that's something that requires emotional intelligence, not just a lot of knowledge, not, not just a lot of hard science. It requires something far more nuanced. Uh, and that's a change capable uh, graduate. And that's a work ready plus graduate. Um, and social entrepreneurship, uh, which is, as I said, one way in which the curriculum and universities can be reformed uh, to focus on the sustainable development goals. That's actually entrepreneurial action together, trying to deal with wicked problems and help for social benefit for folks beyond ourselves. Whereas commercial entrepreneurship's about personal benefit and profit maximization. Social entrepreneurship, you still make money, but you put it back into the enterprise. So I'm not knocking commercial entrepreneurship. I'm just saying that I think in terms of universities looking at what their role is going to be in colleges, in the coming decades, it'll be kind of useful just to have a little reflection, you know, what's our purpose here, not just what's our commercial purpose. I know that's very unfashionable because, you know, it's all about uh, the, the economy, but I think there is actually room for caring for other human beings. Um, but I am from the 60s, so that probably explains that. Um, uh, because all change is learning, you know, and that's the competencies and capabilities you need to negotiate these wicked problems in, uh, in the uncertain future, uh, you know, the knowledge and skills you get today, the competencies are not necessarily the ones you're going to need, nor will they help you manage the mad moments. So uh, you can see how important universities and colleges are and how important you guys are as graduates and as teachers are in actually achieving, in a sense, a sustainable future that is, in a sense, a decent one uh, for humanity. Uh, so what is a work-ready-plus graduate? Well, they're sustainability literate, 
they're change implementation savvy, they're inventive socially, not just entrepreneurially, uh, commercially rather, uh, and they're clear on those tacit assumptions. So in this work that I've done as Australia's National Senior Teaching Fellow, we developed this project for reforming the curriculum around these lines. It's called Flip Curriculum. It's flipping the curriculum to focus on work ready plus graduates um, rather than just looking at competent ones. And being competent makes you work ready for today, which is important, but being work ready plus makes you, uh, in a sense, capable of managing an uncertain future. And so, you know, without this actual embedding this sort of thing into the curriculum, uh, the sustainable development goals will remain on paper. I think graduates from universities will have a critical role in enacting those sustainable development goals between now and 2030. Uh, and I think universities have a role in actually modelling how to do that. So here's some, some of the things. I won't go through this in any detail. We can do the sustainable, and we're doing this all around the world at the moment. You can look at doing it in your research with social impact, in your community action projects, uh, in using the campus as a living laboratory. You know, as Spohn said, we're more likely to act our way into new ways of thinking than think our way into new ways of acting. You know, we learn by doing. So campuses can model how to actually address the sustainable development goals. Um, we can build them into the curriculum. And I'm going to spend just a little bit of time before I leave you just talking about social entrepreneurship in the curriculum as a capstone in many universities now around the world. Um, and that's that one. Uh, I think, you know, it, we've got to understand, I think it's useful for us all to learn as part of our studies in universities how to engage the disengaged. Uh, you know, George Bernard Shaw once said, reformers have the misplaced notion that change is achieved by brute logic. Uh, it's not. It's, it's very emotional. And, of course, if you look at the politics in the states at the moment and if you look at the nature of Twitter and if you look at how um, President Trump operates, he doesn't operate on brute logic at all. He operates on brute emotion. Uh, and there's something about, I think, universities and colleges actually started to come to help get everyone to explore what is going on there. Why is that happening? And uh, how does that relate to engaging people with change? Uh, and, you know, we've got to align the structure of the universities to this. My university uh, has engaged with this uh, with a moral purpose, in fact, although it's got the benefit of being number three in the world now on the uh, higher education, uh, impact, the Times Higher Ed Impact rating. So this year I think we had about 800 universities applied for it. So Western Sydney Universities, which is not a rich university at all, it made number three. It didn't go into it to make number three, though. It actually just, that happened because we were doing it along the lines of what I'm explaining uh, with you now tonight. Um, now, I just want to go through, a, I'm not going to go through these, by, I won't have time to do it, but I just want to show you some of the social entrepreneurship projects we've been working on around the world, and I'll just mention a couple of them to you. Um, uh, one of them I'll mention is the maggots in Benin. So in Benin, uh, what was happening, people were throwing away uh, the bones after, at an abattoir, and because they're trying to create money and work and uh, for folks who have no money and are live in poverty, the, the, the group there ident identified and invented a way of putting maggots onto the bones. They grew the maggots. They fed the maggots to fish, which created food. But they also then said, no, we can make more for us in our poverty by actually feeding them to quails and selling the quail eggs over to the UK. So th that's an example, if you like, of social entrepreneurship where the money is going back into helping the people intend, who are intending to benefit. Um, the 3D Solar Souvenirs, MIT, um, it gave the rubbish pickers of uh, Delhi who go and collect the plastic. They used to get a rupee or half, you know, 50 paisa uh, for a bag of plastic. Instead of that, they actually gave them uh, uh, 3D printers that are solar run. They gave them plastic extruders. They then extruded the plastic and the rubbish pickers now make artefacts for tourists which they sell out of the rubbish in Delhi. So that's social entrepreneurship with a moral purpose. Um, I won't go through the others, but the, the, very, the, the pig farms in, uh, in Samoa are very interesting too, where they're using the, uh, they, uh, they're, they're using the feces from the pigs. They're washing it into a series of ponds, growing algae in the ponds, feeding fish to the algae, and then killing the fish, uh, drying them, and feeding them to the pigs so they no longer have to import 
uh, pig food from, at enormous cost and carbon miles. Um, and uh, that's just some other examples I've listed for you. I wanted to mention Enactus. So I've just done a lot of work this year. In fact, I just did a big webinar this year with all the Enactus folks in the UK. Uh, Enactus is actually literally has thousands of projects operating around the world. And I do commend you to look at the Enactus 2030 site, which looks at how all of the projects that the student entrepreneurs are doing in their universities around the world, how they relate directly to the sustainable development goals. And I've listed a few of them there, down there from the UK, including the Fog Catcher uh, project uh, from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and I've located them against those sustainable development goals for you. Um, now, I'm keeping an eye on the time. So uh, I've got about sort of another 10 minutes, I think, haven't I, Fiona? Um, something like that? Yes, go okay. ahead. You've got plenty of time. Okay, good. Uh, so I hope this is making sense, guys. Remember, you've got the slides and you can follow it up after it. I just wanted to give you a feel for where I'm coming from, I suppose. My university, as I said, um, we set up a farm. We had a farm and we decided to set, up, set it up as a living laboratory for the students, the school students of Western Sydney uh, who come from disadvantaged backgrounds where we actually have that as a living laboratory, which actually exemplifies the indigenous culture that's been living on that river, on the river farm for the last 20,000 years. And the students come in and the aunties actually show them the food is all growing there as they used to grow it. They're showing them how they would live. They then cook the food. Then we've got an old farmhouse, which the university students have helped develop with the VEC students uh, as part of a cultural sustainability project. So the whole thing is, in a sense, all of us doing it together, entrepreneurially, uh, but making it a living laboratory for others to see what the sustainable development goals look like in practice. Um, and now I just want to talk briefly about the, the characteristics of an effective social entrepreneur because they relate directly to the Work Ready Plus graduate. You need to have a moral purpose. Uh, and you need to know what your purpose is. is. If your moral purpose is making money, then that's making money. You need to be self-aware of just what you stand for. Um, good social entrepreneurs like good leaders always listen, link, leverage and lead, always in that order. Always listen first to the situation and the people, link together those that are looking at it, leverage those that are ready to go and always only lead at the end, not at the start. Um, they always use a why don't we approach, not a why don't you. Um, they have the capabilities. We've done studies for the last 20 years on successful graduates in, uh, in nine professions, early career graduates. And what we've found is that all, every one of them always said the reason I was picked, selected by their clients, their bosses uh, and their colleagues as being so effective in their first three to five years in practice was they'd remain calm when things went awry, they could tolerate ambiguity, they could take sensible risks, they persevered, they could uh, work productively with diversity, they could think laterally, remember what I was saying about entrepreneurship, uh, and they were able to build and sustain productive networks. So you can see there's a link there between studies of successful graduates being work ready plus and actually having a chance to look at social entrepreneurship as part of your curriculum using networks like Enactus, you know, which operates all around the world out of universities. Um, and I won't read these out in detail, except I just wanted to put this slide up to show you there are a whole pile of networks now around the world. I've done some work with the Association of Commonwealth Universities a couple of years ago. They've now done a whole uh, survey of 500 universities on what they're doing about the sustainable development goals and social entrepreneurship. So there's all of these various groups now are all looking at social entrepreneurship uh, and around the world uh, and the idea of moral purpose and the idea of higher education actually not just creating work-ready people for industry or commercial entrepreneurs, but in addition, creating people who uh, have a moral purpose and uh, uh, have social entrepreneurship. Uh, and then I wanted to make sure I mentioned Fiona, whom I met last year uh, when I gave a keynote down at the uh, International Confer Conference of Entrepreneurship um, Educators on this same area down in Oxford. Uh, I think, you know, you guys have got enormous potential to look at the purpose of SIE as it relates to the social entrepreneurship area in addition to the commercial entrepreneurship area. And I think that's a direction that I can see you now taking and it's a, looking at the sustainable development goals as part of that, I think, uh, is actually part of that journey that you're now on. Um, I won't go through this except to mention the first slide, which is uh, I uh, work with the regional centres of expertise and education for sustainable development around the world. 
We've got 176 of those, and they all work on local issues that relate to the Sustainable Development Goals community. They're all, they link together schools, uh, community groups, NGOs, vet, vocational education colleges, uh, higher education institutions, businesses, all working on key themes that relate to the Sustainable Development Goals. And we are using those now as a source for identifying social entrepreneurship projects for students from our university to go out to work with uh, as for credit for a capstone on social entrepreneurship addressing the sustainable development goals that really relate to a key issue of that area, not just something fluffy. Um, and so that notion of a capstone on social entrepreneurship uh, using regional centres of expertise in sustainable development. Now, I know Edinburgh has got one, for example, uh, is, is an area of where we can link the left and the right hands a little bit more effectively in the future. Um, I won't go through those ones in any great detail. Uh, the blue economy is worth looking at, though. If you just put it into your search engine, just blue economy, economy innovations. There's 110 innovations. The Maggots one from Benin is a blue economy project. Uh, all around the world that are really interesting if you want to look at ideas for social entrepreneurship uh, in your area, operating out of your college or university, you've got lots of resources like the Blue Economy Innovations to give you ideas on what you might want to do that's decent. Um, now, the final thing is, as I said at the outset, one of my themes is good ideas with no ideas on how to implement them, a wasted idea. So I just wanted to share with you uh, the research that I did in 2014 with uh, colleagues in. Uh, at Harvard and also in, uh, in the UK, looking at um, building sustainable development in the curriculum of universities and the key lessons we learned there, which may be of interest, I thought. Uh, they certainly are something that I've applied at Western Sydney University, which has led us to, in fact, I think, be doing pretty well at the moment as a, as a humble university with 60% of its students first in family, 173 different nationalities represented in the domestic student body, uh, it's not an elite university by any means, but it's a university that I think has gone somewhere by taking this direction that I've been outlining today. So how do we do it? Well, first of all, you look at outcomes, not at in inputs. So you're actually looking at positive impact. Secondly, the listen, link, leverage and lead always in that order. Thirdly, we engage the senior leadership. And it, the, the Barney, the current vice chancellor, you know, when the Times Higher in Impact Ratings came out, you know, that is an added incentive for people to think, oh, look how well we've been recognised there. Now, you know, you can critique rankings, but, you know, it is a, a, an incentive to engage folks. Um, in a sense, engaging the staff is, um, is about making sure that what is proposed is relevant, desirable, clear, and most importantly, feasible for them. So we were very conscious from the outset in actually addressing the the issue of sustainable development at our university in a coherent, systemic way across the curriculum, the research and the community engagement is to not demand too much of people, but just to do it in gentle steps and people could see others inventing and then actually build up uh, from there. So you start always small and you build on successes. And the, the motto is always ready, fire, aim, not ready, aim, 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 have another meeting. Um, and we did a stock take very early so that you do a stock take around the sustainable development goals and you acknowledge people for what they're doing. And sometimes they don't realise that what they're doing relates directly to the sustainable development goals. Um, and always make sure you've got indicators of what success looks like in practice. Uh, so, you know, that's part of that outcomes thing that I mentioned in the first dot point there. Um, and uh, what we've done, of course, starting in 2010, we invented a national steering uh, National Clearinghouse in Australia on what everyone was doing about sustainable development in the curriculum. So you can actually nick ideas from one another. Uh, you know, you can call it benchmarking, but it's actually essentially you know, seeing what fellow travellers are up to so you don't have to reinvent the wheel cold for yourself. Um, and, you know, there's nothing like fellow travellers. That's the key resource we all value when we're actually looking at developing uh, up new capabilities. It's always a fellow traveller further down the path that we're on who's doing well. And that's why I think uh, I'm currently working across 10 countries looking at networking the networks around this area uh, because they sometimes operate in isolation from one another. Uh, and then, of course, you know, there's an incentive about the idea of this whole social entrepreneurship, sustainable development goals actually being an edge in a very competitive uh, environment for uh, administrators and universities. And if you're interested in this what do you do on Monday bit, which is this slide, 
then on that uh, flip correct, and I've given you the link there to the, the site, um, you'll, there's a making, the happen, making it happen section. That site's currently be, being used to develop Work Ready Plus graduates uh, around the world. We've currently got, I think, as of yesterday, 16,500 uh, higher educators around the world using it to actually, in a sense, follow up on the sort of things that I've been saying now. So that's it, my dear colleagues uh, from down under. Um, and, you know, if you are interested, by all means, uh, flip through anything that you've found interesting. It's always good for me to know if I've resonated with something, it makes me feel that the next time I do it, I have an idea of the sorts of things that are useful for folks. Secondly, something you'd like to know more about. Um, and thirdly, you know, initiative you'd like to take. So I'm more than happy for this to be the start of a beautiful relationship, not the end of it. Um, and if you follow up, Rali and Fiona will send out a follow-up survey. By all means, if you're interested in some of the stuff I've set, talked about now, whip back some stuff, they'll aggregate it up. I'll promise to respond to you on that. And then down the track, we can always link up individually. Um, and that's just a bunch of resources that, uh, that you might find interesting there that relate to some of the things if anything took your fancy and you wanted to know more about. So I think that takes me pretty close through to the, uh, the, the time slot, Fiona, so I'll, uh, I'll head back to you. Yeah, um, thank you very much, uh, Jeff. This has been fantastic, much appreciated. Uh, we have just a couple of minutes. Uh, we've obviously got another workshop about to start, so we can't run over too much, but um, definitely a very engaged audience here. So one quick question from Tracy Russell was any advice for engaging disengaged cohorts in cities with challenges with literacy, numeracy and essential skills? Uh, it could be quite relevant to some of the, the colleges here, especially, I think. Yep. Well, uh, that, this, I'm actually writing about this at the moment. So, I mean, the issue about engaging folks who are disengaged is that, as I said, as part of my talk, you know, George Bernard Shaw, you don't engage in brute logic, nor do you wag your finger at them, nor do you tell them they've got to do something. You've always got to listen, link, leverage and lead, always in that order, always listen. And what you're listening for is what's the background ability, needs and experience of this person? What's their background? What's their ability? What's their needs? What's their experience? So if you've got something you want to engage them with, you've got to start with them and then you've got to actually, with great nuance, Related to your reading of them as an individual. So it's, it's an issue of reading and matching. You read the person and then you match to the person. You don't start with what you want to sell and actually try to flog it. You always go inside out with people. Thank you. That was great advice. I think we'll leave it here, if you don't mind. I, I know we've got a few more questions and we'll pass that on to you. And I think maybe what we'll do is, is if it's possible, we'll schedule another little call with you, a Zoom call, and we'll record some of the answers. Might be the easiest way of doing that. So, yeah, that would be lovely. Yeah, yeah. that would be, that would be that's great. That's a good idea. That's what I've done with a few other folks, actually. We followed up a few weeks later, you know, with a webinar of those who are interested with their questions. That, that'd be lovely. Okay. Yeah, yeah that, that would be great. Thank you very much. So thank you again, Jeff, very much. Um, okay. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. This Bye. is just uh, for everybody that's still here. Um, thank you. The next session is actually going to be a workshop from SIE's Anne Davidson. We'll actually be talking a about what SIE is doing with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So that workshop starts in 10 minutes time. That's a more classic Zoom session, so everybody will see everybody else. Everybody will be kind of a workshop participant there. You have to have registered for it separately. So when this finishes, make sure you go and grab yourself a coffee or whatever and log on to the Anne's workshop session. For everybody, the next main session is going to be a panel at 12 o'clock, which is going to be a really fascinating discussion because we've got some people with fantastic vision and view of the future. So I think it's going to be a, a very, very interesting discussion. So grab your sandwiches and join us at lunchtime, 12 o'clock for that. All the links you should have in your email, you should be able to access them through the event by event page. So um, I'm going to close this session off just now.
and uh, we will see you all very soon. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you.